<coughs> ah. <laughs> Hello. Uh, let's start. I want to talk about asset metadata management. Uh, okay, uh, what's the problem to solve? You already know this image, I guess. Um, it's, it's taken last year on the conference. And um, if you take this photo and load it up to, um, to Neos, it looks like that. You have the, uh, the image and you have an empty title and description field. And everything that Neos gets out of that image uh, is uh, when it's uploaded and the original file name. Um, but I haven't taken this photo, but I post-processed it. And if I post-process images, I add a lot of metadata because I like metadata and I have a lot of images and I need to find them later on. So uh, there are actually a title in that image, um, a description, there's, there are outer data, tags, um, the capture date, uh, the location where it's taken, uh, faces are recognized on that image. And also we have a lot of technical details. All, all of that details are automatically en entered by the camera itself. Um, and I have that because I use a professional tool um, to manage that metadata, it's Lightroom, and I guess most of the professional and the amateurs uh, use Lightroom to do that. So it would be very nice to have this the metadata also in NEOS available. And therefore, I kickstarted three packages. Um, it's the NEOS meta, metadata extractor, which extracts the data, uh, the NEOS metadata package, uh, which provides some DTOs for that, and the content repository adapter uh, that's, that stores this data into the content repository. Um, I said I kickstarted uh, these packages, uh, but Rafael here uh, improved it a lot, and I guess we have the most advanced, uh, most advanced metadata extractor which is available in PHP. It, it definitely extracts everything uh, for IPDC and EXIF um, data and puts that in DTOs for that. And then, what can you do that with that? Um, in the newest metadata package, you have a configuration available, uh, which you can use to map this data on the title and caption field of your assets in NEOS. So you just can say, um, if it has already a title, because um, asset is also available as DTO here, um, use that title. If, if you don't have one, use the IPDC title, and if you don't have that, uh, try the EXIF image description. And you can just use any of the EXIF and IPTC IAM data here. So if you want to um, uh, use an, uh, an author tag here or something, you can also do that. And you also can tag this data automatically or put them in, in special um, uh, collections. You have uh, e-latent here, so you can do anything. And then uh, we have the NEOS uh, content repository adapter uh, where all this uh, data is stored in, um, in nodes, not in the actual node tree, not in, under the side node tree, but in a, in a separate node tree under assets, uh, which you then can use uh, in Fusion, for example, to um, uh, enrich images with metadata. So if you have an image prototype, you just can say, okay, find me um, the metadata of this, of this image, and then you can render that. Or, what I think it's uh, much, much more cooler, uh, you can query this asset like you do it with normal nodes. So, um, for my use case, I just say, give me all assets uh, that are of the type image and which have a GPS latitude or longitude. And then um, I build a website uh, and, and a map with all the images on, on that uh, on my website. Okay, thank you. Uh, try these packages out. They are a little bit in the beta stage, remote, but if you use them um, and provide us feedback, we are really appreciate it. So, um, I just want to show you a little example of 
how you can bring your business workflow to news. So I'm Samuel, just call me Sam. I'm working at Web Access in Zurich. Yeah. Um, we have a company called Eldora, which have split up some little to little companies which have different locations and restaurants. So they came to us and with this Excel sheet and told us we have here a really complex Excel sheet which nobody really understand and uh, make something nice. <laughs> so we did this and I show you that life. I try. Sorry for that. <laughs> oh, here it is. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. So, um, that's the website. And I choose a location. Oh, I think you have to... <laughs> this one? Okay, here we are. So, here I can choose the different uh, restaurants. And here it shows the menus for every day or every weekday. And in the front, that it's quite simple. So, how we did this in the back end? That's really interesting, working on... So, you, here you are in the back end. There I can navigate to my week and I have a note for every week. And if I make a new week, I just enter the week number. So the new week is 15. And it automatically generates me um, about 200 notes with... Um, <laughs> some uh, menu groups and for every day a single menu. And then I get this nice overview with uh, inline editing where I can enter everything, price, category, etc. So I don't know what right now. So I go to an existing one. And in the back end they have a price calculation. That's not important for the website, but important for the customer. So we did this with uh, preview modes for every day. And they have some uh, prizes they are given from the company and you can calculate every menu. So, they can do their calculation 
and I don't know um, how exactly this works. This is uh, their business workflow. <laughs> but the really cool stuff is they can print their menus as a PDF. So, for example, for this week, it generates the PDF with some information like icons and so on. Or just for one day, an overview for each menu they have. So yes, that's it. <laughs> Well, NEOS is really great to edit, integrate content, and of course share content with APIs and all that. But what about user-generated content, like campaigns or even like a simple order form, really simple order form? Hmm. How we did this? <laughs> Just let's create a <clears throat> small basket service where we handle the session and give Neil helper to Fusion. Add a prototype that we can show the basket's date on the website and uncache it. And add a simple Neos form. Of course, with a custom email finisher, we can just fetch the content of the basket and add it to the email. Really simple and works. But what about uh, submission form where, where I want to add document notes, including text and of course images, which the client can upload. Of course, create the NEOS form um, and create a custom note finisher, also finisher of the email of the form uh, where we create uh, nodes directly into the uh, content repository. But now we have the whole project done and the application is complete. We use this image everywhere and the client steps in and, okay, now I want to upload PDFs and doc files and yes, these are images. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> I say fair enough, because we only have to change uh, the form fields from image uploads to file upload, and create a small cloud convert service. <laughs> and of course, send each file the customer can upload to the service and integrate the final image to the node. Nothing other has to change. So my basic message is don't make your life hard. Take the easy way if it is, if it is possible. You have so many ways and you have to, to search some ways how you can do it fast and clean. Maybe sometimes only fast. <laughs> but there's the shame <laughs> section, of course. And of course ask the community and talk to the community. We learned a lot this way. And if you want to look, um, on GitHub we have published a few packages recently. And if you're in Zurich, visit us or talk to us if you have questions. And
talk to me if you have detailed questions or want to look how it works really. I don't uh, go public with this dirty hex, but you can look on the demo right now. Well, and I think I'm really fast and totally in time. Thank you. Hi, my name is Christian. I'm here to talk to you about event storming, a um, fast and fun method to explore your problem domain or business domain. Um, let's start what we already have in our pockets. Um, we will use domain-driven design. We know everything about aggregate routes, entities, value objects, bounded context, ubiquitous language. We got this sorted. We have to build our domain model using these tools. So, it's checked. We want to use seekers. We understand this. We have to separate the commands and the queries for the read and the write. We want to use event sourcing with all the um, good things which come with it. Um, events, event store, they form a timeline. Events are immutable and um, yeah, we get things like scalability by um, the idiom message over structure we heard yesterday. So, this is sorted. Now the problem begins. We are the business domain. The other part of the project, the technical part, is already sorted out, but um, this is where our customer wants his problems solved. And his business produces outcomes and revenue for him. And his business domain clearly consists of processes, constraints, triggers, activities, and all the things you see in BPM, L, and stuff. But actually, most of the businesses, they don't know their business in this detail, and I, as a programmer, I don't care, actually. So for me, it's unknown territory, and even if I did the same project in, in the same domain, the new project will be different from the last. So this is where our pain comes from. Um, yeah, this is the point where we can use event storming, to get a grip on our problem and to make a bridge to the techniques we want to employ. Um, yeah, um, in the end, it's really just a method um, you can use to explore your business domain. It helps you to create your domain model. It will help you identify your bounded context. And most times the overlooked but really important part, it, it creates a common understanding uh, among your teammates um, of this problem domain. This is called the ubiquitous language in DDD. So how do we do it? It's easy. You organize a workshop, you gather all your IT staff and the domain experts in one room, you give them maximum space, especially on the walls, because you need post-its, 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 many of them, and pens. So, but this should be one for people, should be enough. The first step you do in your workshop is you name your domain events. You can brainstorm on this. Just ask yourself, what happened yesterday? Think about the past. Think about things you have done or achieved. Don't think about the future, because maybe tomorrow is different. Um, I choose an example like, yeah, I talked gossip with someone yesterday on the phone, but clearly there are things which happened. So I just wrote them down on yeah, these PowerPoint post-its. Um, yeah, I, I dealed a number, clearly. I picked up my phone from my pocket. We talked. Somewhere the call ended, but the call started. Somewhere when the opposite side picked up. So I'm done with the first step. The second step is get these events in the correct temporal order. So I thought about when we phoned, we phoned, we finished phoning when the call ended. But before the call ended, we talked. But before we could talk, we have to call. We, we had to start the call. To start the call, we have to dial a number, and to dial a number, I need a phone, so I have to pick it up. <coughs> Step three in your workshop would be 
um, to name the connections between your events. Actually, these are the commands you will program when you're doing seekers. So you see, we already got um, events we will use in our event store. We got the commands for seekers, and we got a domain language, the ubiquitous language, which helps us to communicate in our team. Oh, usually it's step four, but just a typo. Um, we just iterate over this process. We discuss our domain model and team. We will validate the constraints and the variance and invariance there. Then we refine our domain model and the team has now established its ubiquitous language. So yeah, there you have the bridge between DDD, seekers, and event sourcing. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Right, hi everybody. My name is Bastian Heist, and I foolishly signed up, signed up for this lightning talk yesterday before this social event. So uh, yeah, let's get this over with. <laughs> um, what I'd like to show you is a little tool, or actually two little tools to speed up your coding workflow. One is called Emmet, and what, it's, what it basically is, is a tool that um, allows you to type HTML or allows you to type um, selectors, basically H CSS selectors, and it will generate an HTML structure from that. Let's have a look at what that looks like. I just type something like, hmm? let's try again. Oh, I don't see it. Ah, I don't see it on the screen. Okay, sorry, let's try that again. There we go. I type table greater than TR, greater than TD times four, and press tab. And it'll expand that code into an HTML structure. That's just a simple example, really, but um, there's, there's much more you can do. You can, um, it, it supports placeholders, it supports attribute selectors. So um, if you find yourself yeah, generating or needing to um, create HTML, this is quite handy. And um, even better, and where I actually use it much more than for HTML, is using this for CSS. Because Emmet also supports um, fuzzy guessing. So what you can do in CSS is actually this. I create a CSS class, dot foo. And I just type df and press tab, and it'll expand that to display flex or FDC or whatever you know, JCSP, it's great. And the, the cool thing is really, you don't have to learn these abbreviations. All you need to do is type. Um, unfortunately, sometimes it doesn't work. What gets me every time is FS. I expect it to expand to uh, font size, but it, it's font style. So there are a few downsides to that. But um, for CSS, it's a really useful little tool. There's a plugin for IntelliJ, which you can activate, and it gives you this. Um, as I said, sometimes it doesn't work, um, or it doesn't work as we expect it to because it's based on, on guessing um, what you actually want to do. So there's another thing that um, you can actually make do exactly what you want, and this is called live templates. That's a feature of IntelliJ um, and PHP Storm and s stuff like that, I guess. Um, and what this allows you to do is define your own abbreviations that expand into the things you want them to expand into. So if you find yourself typing the same stuff all over and over again, live templates are your friend. You create them in the, um, in the menu of your IDE. And um, what I did here is just create a new group called Neos Fusion. I add a template to that, and you can see um, that I gave the abbreviation PTT, called this prototype, and you fill in the, the template that you want, it supports template variables. So um, the, the cursor will, when you expand this template, jump to these places where you define the variables. And what happens, yeah. And then you need to define a scope, like in which context should this PTT abbreviation work. And when you use it, 
in my example, it's a fusion file, and I'm too lazy to type these prototype things, it just expands into the stuff I want. So this is also quite useful. I use it a lot, especially for React, which can be verbose sometimes, and um, also for Fluid. And actually, I created a, a repository on GitHub, which um, URL I did not include, <laughs> but I can, share, I can share it. But you should also be able to find it just by searching Fluid Live Templates. And that gives you, for most Fluid view helpers, it gives you these live templates where you can just type, for example, um, F double uh, F colon if and press tab, and it expands into all these conditions and stuff like that. So that saves you a lot of typing. Sorry? Sorry, I didn't get the question. There was a ready made package for Fluid. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Okay. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe you can share that afterwards, even though I did. Yeah. Um, basically, that's it. These are the two things I wanted to show you. I use especially um, live templates a lot in situations where I find myself typing the same stuff over and over again. And this is a really handy tool. Thanks for listening. So, sometimes you don't have to write always uh, PAP and all that kind of stuff. You have to do some front-end stuff. Uh, to my person, um, I worked at Gesagt Getan. We are the event sponsor. It's our responsibility that you have drunk too much yesterday. So sometimes I often see this. You are, we are too busy to improve our workflow, and especially in the workflow in the front end, because it's not that easy with all that SaaS and post CSS and all that stuff. And I wrote a package. It's called galpfile.js. And I use it since years for our NEOS project, and it's quite handy. And it's just too fast. So what I do on the CSS side, I have to read it. It does SAS, like many of you know. You could also implement less, but I always don't know anybody who use it. So I don't use it. It fixes many fair bugs for browsers. For example, the Internet Explorer 11 and the Edge can't handle the unit for VMAX. So it just handled that. You have really cool helper for grid and flagbox. You have selector matches. You, it sorts your media queries in the right order. You have uh, responsive font size. You have rounds up pixels, all that kind of stuff that post testers bring to you. It's quite awesome. And the whole JavaScript part is done with roll-up, where you have tree shaking. In the first time I used this part, my JavaScript get a third, a quarter smaller, because it kicks everything out that you don't need. It's really, really nice. You can choose between bubbly and bubble. Bubbly is just a bit faster. I prefer that one, and the code is it's also smaller, but with Bubble you can do a lot of more, but most of the time it just works. You have some tasks for optimizing images like PNG, GIFs, SVGs, and JPEGs, and you have um, automatic inclusion of file headers. You have browser sync. You can create some nice sprites for icons. And the main thing, it's explained everything here. You can just create a config.json where you overwrite the default config. And basically, it just goes to the folder. Where's the marker? This one? Yes. And looks up for these fi this files. And these files without the underscore, it just takes and render it to the public folder. It creates from the images and the sprites the, the files, the sprite, the pin, the logo, optimize it if you want, and create the, the JavaScript and create the CSS styles. And quite handy, the stuff 
for working, for example, the, the browser, browser sync, it's really cool, you just can press save and the UI gets updated in all your browsers where you're surfing at your, your phone, your tablet, and all the browsers, you can change live on code if it's working or not. And that's quite handy because you don't have to reload every browser. It's very handy for uh, cross-browser testing, all that kind of stuff. It even works when you have connected to browser stack and all that kind of stuff. It's really, really cool. And if you want to use it, you can use it because it's on GitHub and it's open source with MIT. You can fork it, you can change it. Um, I think it's a quite useful tool. It was grown over the last, I think, two or three years. It was completely rewritten four times. It's not the whole history, it's not on, 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 on GitHub. It would be also a long shame at the beginning, but it's, it's a quite handy tool. And I would appreciate if you use it, if you fork it, if you make some pull or push uh, some pull requests, it would be really nice. So that's it. So last talk. So hello, last talk before lunch, so I uh, have to be on time. <laughs> it's, um, so that's me. Um, I didn't prepare too much slides. Um, so, and thanks, thanks a lot for vo voting, though it made no difference on the selection. It still gives me a nice feeling to, have, to see some, some little um, dots on it. I want to talk about um, testing, about unit testing, and about how to make it better and faster and more fun to write, because um, it made my life easier, and I just want to want to share it. So, in general, I think um, most of you have the same experience. My tests look like so: okay, prepare something, and then I execute something. It's usually the code on the test, and then I get a result, and I somehow have to validate it in terms of correctness. And there is, a, in all frameworks, usually has some like assert equals, or you co compare it by equality, and usually it's not working that nice, so it's, it's not what I want. So why is that? Um, because equality uh, is a, depends on the use case. For if I have a person, so I, I'm a person, so I, I have a name, my, uh, I also have a birth date, so it's not written on the screen. And um, if, if I am represented as a, an entity or a class, I have an ID, and so equality is really easy, so I just compare the IDs, and so it doesn't matter if my name changes. It's very fast and efficient in, product, in production code, but not for testing, because if I use this for my test assertions, I verify the only property that my customer is not interested in. So the test has not really any meaning. So I have to um, re-implement equality all over again and make like a smaller, more verbis version out of it. And I did this like three or four times, and it got uh, very annoying. So what, what do I expect from, from a test? So it should read really fast. So there's a small preparation, a small execution, and also a small search. And I do not want to like, I have a person, so I have an age, um, a birthday, and a name, and so I have two assertions but maybe it gets more, and then I have three, and then I have a letter, and it has a sender and a recipient, so I have like a nested object, and it has two persons inside, and okay, now I can just assume the persons are correctly, but it, still I need to test it, because it depends on my implementation, and it gets messy very fast. And first idea would be, okay, I extract a method, and it does all this, this checking, but then I have very poor messages. Um, error messages because 
Name is incorrect. Hmm. Yeah, which one? So it's a sender or a recipient? I don't know. And, um, I extracted a, so I, find, I found an approach so it allows me to reuse the code for validation within the project, within the, but also in other projects which depend on it and um, those messages are generated automatically, so to say. Um, they are, hmm, wrong direction. So um, the tests now basically look like this, it's Java. Um, so there's one line of validation. It's the format, it's inspired by the Hempcrest matchers. They are part of JUnit. They are similar matchers in other testing frameworks. They didn't work so well. They tend to get very bulky if you implement them, so I replaced them by some, by an own implementation. So if you want to look it up, how it works, it's very little code, it will take you like I think 30 minutes to re-implement it in any other language you are using. As a, um, it has a technical term, it, um, and it made my life much, much more easy. And as a fun fact, there's no dependency in this project, so it doesn't need JUnit at all. I tr wanted that, um, that to exclude because there are so many different versions, and then you have to use the correct version of this library and so on. So no dependencies, just some classes, like I think seven of them. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much for all the Lightning Talk speakers. Um, that was a brilliant time management. I've never seen that. We was always waiting for a loud sound, which uh, would have been appeared <laughs> when they crested the time. But he was two seconds uh, faster and six seconds faster. That was really crazy and brilliant. Thank you very much. And I could not use this. I could use, but this is, uh, that was pretty cool. Thank you. And please now enjoy your lunch. and. We will continue uh, 1430. Thank you very much. Um, everyone, I'm sorry. Can you also give feedback to Sebastian Kufis on the React UI? Because we didn't do that previously. Please do. Thank you. Have a good lunch. <laughs>